I'm here with John Huang, the chief engineer about the Acura ZDX on the Honda Prologue, and we're here to talk about the development story and some of the engineering decisions made on this product. The first question I have for you is, where did the engineering responsibilities lie between Honda and your partner, General Motors, on this product? Yeah. So the partnership began about four years ago, and we had the Honda engineers move to Michigan from Japan and Ohio to form a team to work with GM. So the kind of the collaboration scheme or separation was um, GM focused on the platform, so chassis, uh, the um, frame rails and uh, powertrain, and then Honda took care of the industry speak. We call it top hat. So that's kind of the inside and outside that customers can see and engage with. So that was designed in our LA studio, um, and then the Honda engineers engineered it to fit within that platform from General Motors. So before we get into the running gear. Uh I want to talk to you about some of the interior packaging. Obviously, when you look at a lot of the individual switch gear, dealing with the fact that it is an Ultium architecture, you're dealing with GM piece parts, mm -hmm. but you guys had the freedom, from my understanding, to kind of pick where you wanted everything to be from an actual usability perspective, correct? Correct. So what we did was we kind of communicated and aligned with General Motors on what kind of hardware we wanted. Uh, we wanted two distinct screens. We wanted a climate control that was completely individual, no, you know, no sharing buttons on a touch screen. So we kind of asked for that. Then GM gave us a list of available parts and then our studio picked. And then we placed all of those exactly where Honda would put them. So, you know, you might say the buttons or switches are GM parts and that's true. But where we place them is how you get the feeling that when you're sitting inside is like a Honda. So the position of the handles, switches and buttons and displays are all exactly Honda. Because it's a fairly gimmickless interior, which thank you for doing that. <laughs> and, and was that just because you wanted your customers who are coming from like a pilot or a CRFE to feel right at home at the prologue versus like an EV you know, science project? Yeah, correct, correct. We wanted everything to be very familiar and easy to understand and use. So we thought that was the key to help us transition to EVs and introduce an EV to our current hybrid owner so that we make it easy for them. So moving into the actual mechanical engineering, mm -hmm. starting with the battery pack, how big of a pack are you working with and you know, what kind of cells and how, how big are the yeah, actual? Yeah, it's, it's the Altium battery, so it's an 85 kilowatt hour usable. 10 module battery pack. And serviceability at the dealers is, you don't have to take this to a GM dealer to get it serviced, No, correct? all the tools and equipment and know-how is within our Honda dealer network. Uh, talking about suspension layout, obviously this is different than your ZDX. Mm -hmm. uh, can you walk me through uh, the suspension design? Are the dampers passive or adaptive and yeah. just the, some yeah, of the so ideology behind it? Both front and rear suspension is multi-link design with passive dampers, um, four-wheel disc brakes, um, it's a mostly a front wheel drive package. The motor is always bigger in the front, so it has a permanent magnet motor. And then on the all wheel drive models, it's a uh, induction motor. So when there's a torque demand, that'll turn on. So it's help. essentially an on-demand all wheel yeah. drive setup. Yeah. Why go front wheel drive? I know uh, most of the vehicles in this class are rear wheel drive based, why front? So what we've really prioritized was that ease of transition from our current hybrid owners to, to the EV. So we really wanted to do a more front bias design, so that way it's a familiar handling trait for them. Um, talking about suspension setup, what was the goals from a tuning perspective and you know, physically, is the hardware you're only working with passive dampers, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we had um, Honda dynamic engineers work with the GM engineers to really align on kind of the Honda values and that fun to drive feeling. So we kind of narrowed down onto the uh, spring and dampers and uh, EPS or power steering setting. So we really tuned that to have a Honda feeling, so kind of light, direct, connected feeling. So it's a very lively execution. So, you know, we played a lot with the valving and then spring rates. So GM gave you, uh, your GM partner gave you a decent amount of freedom with how you could actually tune their, their I guess, chassis, correct? Co correct. So in, at the beginning of the program, we shipped up a bunch of Honda cars and competitor cars, and we drove them together so there was a common language of what we wanted. Um, and from there, we had engineers from Japan come to the GM Proving Grounds for weeks at a time, and we would just iterate to get the feeling right. A question I've asked a lot of different OEMs at this point, mm -hmm. at least their engineers, um, on paper, a lot of EVs, at least from a, like a macro perspective, look mm -hmm. very similar, right? You all have skateboard architectures. Mm -hmm. You have around 85 kilowatt hours mm -hmm. of usable uh, battery. You're looking about a little less or around 300 miles of range. Mm -hmm. How do you make this feel like a Honda product? Because again, on paper, most vehicles are largely the same. Everything's multi-link for the most part. 
lot of them are front or yeah. like what is done to this vehicle to make it feel like a Honda? Yeah, and I think you'll, you'll experience it when you drive it is the dynamics, the, the, the feeling, the visibility, that and the placement of the controls is really Honda. Um, and the design, right, it's very familiar. It looks like, you know, the front face was inspired by the Honda E and the design is so clean and simple the way it, our current designs are. So we want to impart that feeling and then it, it helps accentuate that EV experience. So one of the comments I'm sure you've seen when the car was unveiled, either the ZDX or the Honda mm -hmm. part of this is, there's a public perception that this is just a GM product with a Honda badge on it. And you know, based on our conversations off camera, that's clearly not true. Mm -hmm. Can you explain from a development perspective how that worked and why it's really a Honda, not just a General Motors product? Yeah, that's a fair question. So, you know, obviously from looking at the car, you know it's not just a badge engineered vehicle. So we had a, you know, hundreds of engineers in Japan and Ohio and designers in LA, dozens of them working so hard to make it a uniquely Honda feeling and, and, and uh, understandable design. Um, and the way everything is placed, the sight lines, the packaging, we really try to focus on that so that way we give that impression, right? So the, uh, you know, the hardware might be coming from somewhere else, but the way we, way we place them and the way the driver engages it should be a uniquely Honda experience. So, you know, I'm telling all the Honda loyalists to please drive it and give it a try. <laughs> um, the next question I have is, Hondas are known of being very reliable. Um, the GM side of things, I own GM products, they've been good to me, but you know, from a lot of Honda owner perspectives, they don't want to give up the Honda QDR cycle. Mm -hmm. From a manufacturing perspective, yes, this is built in a GM plant in Mexico. What has Honda done to guarantee Honda quality when it comes to building this product? Yeah, so what we've done is um, we've had lots of engineers go there in a very regular basis and with a normal cadence that supports not only the General Motors development process, but also like the Honda expectations. Um, so we've had lots of engineers to support and make sure any problems are fixed immediately. Also, there's um, inspections and uh, uh, other checks that are going on when, when the car leaves the line before Honda takes over. So we're doing our best to make sure that we're meeting the Honda customer's expectations. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. You've gotten the crash course from the chief engineer. Now it's time to briefly go over the big picture items like price, trim levels, and interior and exterior. Now let's start with price. This thing starts at about $48,000 for the base model front wheel drive variant. That is a whopping 212 horsepower and gets about 280, 90 miles of range. As you move up the trim levels, the Elite we're about to drive, which comes as all wheel drive standard, is almost $60,000. In that variant, you get the dual motors, it's 288 horsepower and you get like 280-ish miles of range. It is expensive. Now, from an exterior perspective, despite the GM bones, to the point the engineer makes, it actually looks like a Honda product. It's fairly well styled. That philosophy of Honda ergonomics does carry over into the interior space. If you've never been in a GM before and you're stumbling into your Honda dealer, for the most part, it's going to feel like a Honda product good door pockets, no gimmicks on the inside, everything's traditionally laid out. That's what this product does very, very well. Now, the truth of the matter is, is because this is an Altium, if you look at all the individual switch gear, everything from the seats to the interior electronics to the infotainment, it's all GM. Will that bother you? Well, I'll leave that up to you. But with all that said, I think it's time for us to go take this for a quick drive with our latest, most premium employee. All right, Chris, we're outside of Napa on Butts Canyon Road. I put this thing in a sport. We're in the elite trim level, which means all wheel drive and like 288 horsepower. You ready? Oh yeah. So as we, we heard from John, they really put a lot of effort into that fake engine noise. <sighs> yeah. All right. The acceleration run. We're going to get back out of sport. This car does not have adaptive dampers and it is on a GM architecture. And I know, joking aside from all the comments perspective, Chris, you know, everyone's going to be like, why would you buy a Honda that is really a General Motors product? And after spending, I mean, God, we've spent way too much time on this thing on, you know, these really wet Northern California roads that 
a lot of them have been shut down due to flooding. And I will say, despite everything, at least initially, looking like a General Motors product, I mean, you said it off camera, a lot of this feels like it's like a Honda in its layout in, in some ways feel. I think that's a fair statement, right? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, if if you walked into a, into a Honda dealership and you got into and out of different products, if you got into this, there's not really anything that would tip you off otherwise. Yeah, if you're a regular customer who yep. doesn't know any better, yep. and you know as Honda has been saying, their 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 customers don't cross shop General Motors products, so they won't realize that all the switch gears out of every GMC, a modern GMC, have been out of like the new Canyon. No, it's like you've. It, it feels like a normal car, and I think you know internally for them, they know this is going to be that feeder product. It's for people who want to buy a Honda, but they want it to be EV. From a driving experience, even it being a front-wheel drive SUV, a based SUV, it feels like a Honda, and, it, and it, in many ways feels better than a lot of let's call it more regular Honda products. It being multi-link all the way around. I mean, this road is very, very bumpy from being washed out probably a billion times, and you said it rides really well. Yeah, I mean, we've been going over what is basically war zone tier roads all day, and yeah, it it's it's super. Compliant. Super compliant, yeah. It's hard, man, and we talked to John about it, and this is a question I'm having with more and more and more engineers. As all of these EV, SUVs, and CUVs become more and more the same, at least on paper, how do you distinguish them from a driving character? And while, yes, I mean, you and I were at the Lyric launch together, and that is an Altium-based CUV. Yes, that's a rear-wheel drive, but this is being front-wheel drive. How does this, does this feel a whole lot different? And... Not really, but most of these kind of generic e, you know, MPC EV SUVs all feel the same. The one Honda trait that this definitely does have is it has pretty fast steering. But I'm gonna be honest, right? I mean, this is a classic car that people really want all they care about, and if they're gonna lease, because you absolutely should not buy it for yeah, this generation EV, you're gonna lease something like this. You care that it's compliant, you care that it's quiet, and it seems to get reasonable range. This is a very early pre-production prologue, at least that's what the engineers have told us. So I don't know if the range number you know, is truly like in the high 200s for this elite trim level, but yeah, it's fine. I mean, I wish I could be you know, super enthusiastic about like this is a god tier driving experience. I'm glad Honda made it. No, it's, it's not that, but honestly, they're kind of linked to the game too. I think that's, we, we talked to John about it. You know, when they were developing this five years ago, this class of EV SUV was pretty empty, right? You had Mach-E, yep. which isn't very good. You have ID4, which is really bad. And, you know, you have the Model Y, which, you know, is a Tesla. This didn't, you know, there weren't all the Korean and all the other brands didn't have SUVs in the segment, and now they do. And this is slotting into that segment where everything feels the same. And hopefully the fact that the interior technology in this is actually pretty decent because it's not Honda's infotainment. Uh, and the dealer experience and the fact that, you know, I'm hoping there are reasonable lease deals, even though the MSRP of this thing's like 60 grand and fully loaded. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see what this does for them as a brand and whether or not people totally hate the fact that it isn't truly a Honda product underneath. But past that, though, I think it's time, Chris, that we head into the final thoughts. All right. Final thoughts on the Honda Prologue. Look, if you've made it this far in the video, you can clearly tell this was not super high energy. And the honesty part behind that is we didn't get a lot of time behind the wheel. It rained the whole time. It was a not the most positive shooting experience. The other part of it is this is a class of car that's particularly difficult to get excited about. It is a middle of the road, not bad, not tremendous EV. And this would have been fine or great but in today's ever-changing EV landscape, this is really expensive. It starts at like forty-eight, forty-nine thousand dollars. It tops out at sixty grand. You know, in the all-wheel drive configuration that we drove with higher horsepower, it isn't that fast. It doesn't get over three hundred miles of range. It doesn't blow you away with crazy exterior or interior styling or performance numbers. It's just a totally fine somewhat luxurious, expensive EV SUV. And and as Mark said off camera, for most people, 
you're just going to buy a Honda Pilot, which costs less money. It's not an EV, but it's more usable and you don't make any compromises. And that becomes the hard thing for the prologue. So with that, thanks for watching. Hope to see you soon.